Hello, I'm Katherine Stevens from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from ACS Spring 2021. We're joined today by Dr. Haibo Huang and Yang Hong He from Virginia Tech. They're separating beer waste into proteins for foods and fiber for biofuels. Dr. Huang? Well, thank you, Kathleen, for this great opportunity for, talk, for Ellen and I to talk about our research. So our research topic is simultaneous production of two three built in the dial and the protein concentrate from blue or spent grain. For some of you who are not familiar with blue or spent grain, actually it is a waste product or byproduct generated from beer industry. So for most of the beer we are drinking, it is made from barley. But the problem is not all components in barley can be fermented to beer. Those unfermentable components in barley, like protein, fiber, lipids, and the minerals, they all accumulate and end up in a waste stream called, two, called blue or spent grain. And the two, um, currently blue or spent grain is underutilized and it's is unutilized and some of them are even sent to the landfills leading to substantial resource losses and uh, uh, and may cause environmental concerns because blue or spent grain, they spoil very fast. So we came up with, with the idea to develop a separation process to separate the protein fiber to major components from uh, this waste material. The separated protein could be used as a sustainable and plant-based protein ingredient for animal feed and also to be incorporated into different food products. And we further convert the fiber into a biorenewable chemical called T3-butanodile using a novel bacteria called Bacillus lichniformis. And this bacteria was recently isolated from, um, by Dr. Ohio in our research group from the Yellowstone National Park hot springs over there. And this bacteria has a unique property to convert different carbon hydrates into T3-butanodile at high temperature and high pH conditions. And the 2 3 butane dial is a very valuable compound and has increasing applications in the pharmaceutical, cosmetics, food, and the beverage industries. So in summary, we develop an integrated process to convert a waste material, blue or spent grain, from the beer industry to, uh, to two value-added products, protein concentrate and the biorenewable chemical, 2 uh, 3 butane dial. So we think our approach might increase the sustainability of our society. So in the last, I wanted, uh, we wanted to thank our sponsors, Virginia Tech Pruitt and Animal Nutrition Foundation, Virginia, Virginia Agriculture Council, as well as the USDA SARE Student Research Program. So I'll stop here. Alan and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you both. Are there any questions from viewers? Please state your name and affiliation in the chat window when you ask your question. I'll start with a question um, of my own. So what gave you the idea to turn beer waste into proteins for food and fibers for biofuels? Yes, so let me take, let me ask this question. When, so when I first started my career at the Department of Food Science at Virginia Tech back to five years ago, and I was looking for some interesting project to work with, and my, our department has a very good relationship with the beer industry. So we occasionally meet with each other and talk about the potential collaborations. And when I was talking to them and the, what are the potential problems or current issues that we could help solve with. So they came up with the, the, uh, the, the blue spend grain. They, they, they mentioned that it is a, they believe this is a very nutritious and resources and material, but somehow it is underutilized. And they have, uh, and if there's no local farmers surrounding, they have it's a kind of headache for them to ask the waste company to haul them away. So when I looked into the composition of this blue spent grain to see what's inside, why why it is currently currently underutilized, then I, we found that actually the it contains a fair amount of the proteins. It's good. It contains 20 to 30% of proteins inside. And but the real problem is it has a very high fiber content, up to 50, 60% of fiber in it. So most of the animals like pigs, chickens, and our humans, we don't have a digestion system that effectively digests such a high fiber content. 
So we can, that's why we came up with a solution that why not we separate the protein and the fibers out. These proteins could be used for, for a bunch of application of fibers. We could further use it to produce biofuel because when I did my um, PhDs and the postdoc trainings, I was trained as a fermentation engineer. So we could convert a different type of fibers and carbon hydrates into biofuels and biochemicals. So this is kind of like a, to apply or integrate my current ex, my expertise and with the industrial needs to create such an interesting project. And then Alan, Alan at the time joined my lab and she is really interested in this project. So we started kind of working together to develop this, this integrated process. Great. So another question, how does the alkylase enzyme separate protein from fiber? Uh, okay, I will answer this question. Like, uh, because the enzyme can break uh, the band, uh, uh, like uh, connected the proteins. So after uh, break the band, uh, the protein become peptides. So they can be easily dissolved in the water. And uh, in the next step, I use a, a shrinking sieve. Uh, so uh, the small particle size protein and it can be easily separated out. Is the composition of the protein concentrate similar to other protein products that are plant-based, such as soy or pea proteins? Uh, yes. Uh, in our previous study, I uh, analyzed the amino acids composition of this kind of protein. Also, I compared the uh, uh, amino acids uh, with uh, uh, fish meal protein. So some uh, especially the essential amino acids, uh, the, uh, com the content is very uh, similar. Yes. Yeah, so, so originally the blue spend green has about 20 to 20 to 30 percent of protein inside and a bunch of the fibers. So things we separate the protein and remove the fibers out, we could really concentrate the protein to up to 45, 50 percent range that really opens up the windows for the applications of these new proteins. So if we look at the other agriculture materials like the, the soybean, soybean meal, it has a very similar protein content from 40 to 50%. And the soybean meal is currently widely used in the animal feed industry and also incorporates some of the food products. So that's why we think by not only separating the proteins, we also concentrate the protein to a high level that allows the new applications for this uh, protein from blue or spent grain. So spent grains are used in cattle feed. If this method that you've come up with were to become widely used, would it create a shortage of cattle feed? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. We actually when we were when we were talking about these technologies to to different people, and some people did mention that their concern that if these technologies became very successful and convert all blue spent grain into the proteins for the other uses, how about the cattle? Because blue spent grain currently is widely used to feed the cattle. So our answer is that we are not we are not trying to convert the proteins to the other products. We are we, what we do is just to separate the proteins out and concentrate it into concentrated as a high protein concentrate. So this protein could still be potentially to use the, to feed the cattle. And also the other components like fibers that has not traditionally um, be used by other animals, we could convert it to the biofuel. So we are not like taking the food away from cattle. We are more like a producing more opportunities for cattle, not only cattle, but also other, other animals and also human food. And another, another thing I wanted to say is that for, for, for blues, for blues, they don't, they, they don't have the farmers surrounding buys and that they, they have to pay extra money to the waste management company to haul away this waste materials and send it to the landfills. So the, our technology could really potentially collect this portion of the blue spent grain, which will currently send it to the landfills and uh, to convert it to something valuable. And this again, this protein, collected protein and dried, could be could be used to to send to 
to feed the cattle and also feed to the any other animals and the human people. So what types of food products have you explored adding the protein to? I, I use this kind of protein to uh, replace the fish meal in the shrimp feed. So uh, my uh, study shows that up to 50% of the fish meal in the shrimp feed uh, can be replaced by this uh, spent grain protein. Yes. Yeah, so so currently, we are, as, I, as we mentioned, we have several potential applications used as animal feed and also used as a human food. So we are, we are still in the animal trial stage to look into the feasibility to incorporate our proteins into different animals. And we came up with the first idea to, feed, to use this protein to feed the shrimp because in the shrimp industry, fish meal is widely used as a protein source. And the fish, if you look at the fish meal price in the last 20 years, it increased a lot by more than five times, all the way to from, from two to $300 per ton to $1,500 per ton. That's created a lot of economic uh, burden to the uh, fish, shrimp, uh, fish feeding or shrimp feeding farmers. So based on our experiment, our our protein could replace up more than 50% of fish meal in shrimp feed. So we think that it could provide a sustainable and a potential low cost protein source to, uh, to, the, to the agriculture industry. And also we were thinking there might be some other opportunities for using our proteins. For example, we could incorporate the proteins into the protein beverage for human to, consum to consume. Or uh, we could incorporate these proteins in different type of food, like a cookie, bread, to have the enhanced the enhanced the protein cookies or enhanced the protein bread. That's really my dream. You know, we could uh, capture those waste proteins and send it back to the food supply chain. And but this, of course, the, uh, we are, this is kind of our future work. Is our dream. Uh, it needs lots of the future research including the product development and the and the human tasting trials like sensory evaluations to see people really like this pasty that, that like the tasty of the blue spend green incorporated food that's great you mentioned that your postdoc found a new bacterial species in a Yellowstone Park spring that can convert sugars to 2,3-butanidol. That sounds like a really interesting story. How did that come about? I'll say, yeah, that's a, that was quite a good story. That, um, yeah, Dr. Josh Ohio, that, uh, he is from our research group, and he, he, he went to the Yellowstone National Park several years ago and, and kind of collect a bunch of the bacteria, different species, and we wanted to see that uh, are there any specific unique properties of this bacteria. So we, we first we were targeting a, we were targeting to separate the pro to to use this protein to convert the different carbon hydrate to ethanol, uh, another very valuable biofuel product. But we were not quite successful. This bacteria could only produce a very um, little amount of the ethanol. Then we came up when we then we kind of accidentally found that this bacteria could come is a very good to sleep built in a dial generator. So we we kind of we first uh, we test it and it works well and we further test it and it works very well. And another very unique property of this bacteria is that it survives very well and it works very well at high temperature and high pH conditions. So this could give us a good opportunity for the non-sterile fermentation because in the as a fermentation engineer, the the, mo the most thing we worry about is the contamination because we wanted this bacteria to grow, produce certain type of uh, chemicals, but other bacteria also blend it in or contam contaminated in and really mess up the whole fermentation. But this bacteria is very strong at high temperature, high pH conditions, so it could out compete other bacteria during the fermentation process. This really provide us a very low robust fermentation and also the non-sterile fermentation to eliminate the, eliminate the sterilization process, which is very energy intensive. What about um, applications for the fiber portion of the spent grain? Hmm. Uh, 
the the fiber part like because it has a high content of hand cellulose and it can be uh, used to produce like xylose and uh, uh, xylito, like this uh, kind of sugar things. And this xylito also can be used uh, in the food industry. And uh, also because uh, this fiber, it has a high content of carbon. Uh, so it can be used to uh, produce active carbon or other cellulose based uh, um, nano uh, adsorbent and uh, which can be used in the uh, wastewater uh, treatment industry. It's very interesting. Yes. So could this procedure be easily scaled up and is it cost, eff cost effective? Yeah, so this when when we first started our project, we really use a very small scale, like use beakers and shaking flaskers, dealing with a very tiny amount of the um, blue spandagolin, like five to 10 grams. So after, year, after a few years of the verifi uh, verification of the concept and approval of concept, we could, we now we kind of scaled up this process by about 100 times. So which allows us to produce five to 10 pounds of the proteins and the fibers from the blue spend gray. And this protein and fibers, as, as we could allow us to do the further testing, like the animal feeding testings, and also for the bio um, fermentation testings to convert fibers to 2 3 butanedial but so the beautiful part of this product for, for this um, process that is very simple, scalable, and but very effective to separate the protein and the fibers out. But we also realize that you know five to ten pounds means a lot to us, but it is still means a very small scale in terms of future commercializations. So in the next step, we were thinking if we could partner with other institutions and also with the in, maybe industrial partners that we could scale up to our process to the pilot scale in a range of 100 kilograms to one, one tons of the per day of the scale that could really give us a confidence to move the project forward. And at that time, when we successfully scaled up to the 100, to 100 kilograms to one ton, one ton per day, then we could further see the, the um, commercialization potential and uh, also the and also have a more idea about the production cost of these proteins and the fibers. So in terms of the cost of the proteins, the, this is always the biggest, biggest issue that industry wanted to know when they wanted to adopt our technology. So we did some of the preliminary test, uh, analysis on the production cost on the protein side. So we, uh, based on our analysis, it currently is about $1,000 per ton. Uh, to produce this protein product. So just a, what does $1,000 per ton mean? Just to give you a reference, currently it's a fish meal we are trying to replace in the agriculture field. The fish meal's price is $1,500 to $2,000 per ton. So we think our, our, my, our product might have the market competitive in the future if it is scaled up. Uh, of course, we need to do more of the analysis and uh, when we have more data to support uh, our cost analysis. So what are the next steps for your research? So next step is uh, uh, because now we got some uh, preliminary data and uh, some uh, process optimization still needed like uh, how to uh, 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 improve the uh, protein separation efficiency to a high level. Also, uh, the uh, sugar production uh, from this uh, kind of fiber, uh, we want to uh, also increase this uh, 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 sugar production efficiency to get uh, a high concentration of the uh, but uh, butanidiol to the butanidiol. Yeah. And also, like uh, more people. Uh, care about the coast. So if we can do some uh, techno-economic analysis and uh, provide a more uh, coast uh, reference uh, uh, to uh, like various other, other people. So maybe this uh, technology can be uh, used uh, by a white population. Yeah. Yeah. 
And also we were thinking because a plant-based protein is getting popular uh, because people are for the people are care about the health and uh, also care about the sustainability issues. So we were really thinking if we could incorporate our protein in some real food products, like I mentioned, the bread, the cookies, and the pasta, and uh, see, uh, it's, it's kind of my our dream to see we could really see this protein extracted from a waste material send back to the food supply chain into the food product. And the people kind of like it and they wanted to use it. That's really our hope you know, to convert waste to valuable resources to support the health issues or sustainability future. Absolutely. So my last question for you, uh, what is the take home message about this research that you want to leave with our viewers? So I think overall, we, we develop a very interesting and effective process to convert the waste material to the value added product to support the sustainability of our economy or our society. And I wanted to say it's really cool to work, to, com to do some work to convert a waste material to something valuable. Well, thank you both. The archived version of the session will soon be posted at www.acs.org slash ACS Spring 2021 conferences. Please join us for our next press conference tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Thank you.